Uh, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the gathering of your people. We thank you for the presence of your spirit. Where two or three are gathered, the scripture says right there you are. And as we are gathered, we ask that you will illuminate our lives with your word in the name of Jesus. The entrance of your word, the Bible says, bring it like an unstinted symbol. We ask that you will increase us in our understanding. As the Bible says, that a man of wisdom will increase in understanding, that you will increase our understanding tonight. In the name of Jesus. And like the psalmist said, that your word, O God, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto our part, that your word will indeed continuously illuminate our lives. In the name of Jesus. We give you glory and we'll bless you. I ask that you make my mouth like a pen of a ready writer, right full of dividing the water truth, that we may all be blessed in your presence. Thank you, Father and our King. We give you glory and bless you, for it's in Jesus' glorious and matchless name we pray. All right, in this church uh, for our workshop, we've been going through a series, our comeback series, and uh, I want to believe that's been exciting so far. Amen. I want to believe that's been exciting so far, and we're just going to continue, you know, uh, in the same series tonight, and we're just going to be looking at another dimension of it. I believe, I believe we've been on it for a couple of weeks now, and I believe that we've been treating, you know, different topics and, you know, different aspects of our lives, how God, you know, uses setbacks as comebacks in our lives, amen. How God uses setbacks as comebacks in our lives. If you are a fan of any sport, whatever kind of sport it is, whether it's soccer, tennis, you know, swimming, whatever kind of sport it is, you know, football, uh, we all know that the victory is sweeter right, when a team comes back from behind. Amen. We all know that. It's not like you cannot win outrightly, you know. If you do a spot, you know, you start out a game, you know, your team is playing against another team. If y'all just win, let's say soccer, for example, you just win straight out, 4-0. You know, you just, oh, yeah, we won. But let's assume you guys were 2-0 down, and then you have to come back from being 2-0 down to 3-2. It becomes a whole lot sweeter. You know what I'm saying? So the victory is still the same, but it just feels a little better when you have to come back from being down. So it's, 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 all, it's a whole lot more interesting and sweeter when we come back. And that's why we've been talking about this comeback series, because life is full of setbacks. Amen. Life is full of setbacks. By now, I believe that we all know that. And that's why we're taking a little time on this uh, comeback series. And as we proceed forward tonight, I just want to remind us of some truths that we've learned so far in our comeback series, some of the truth that we've learned so far. And I believe we all have the leaflet, amen. Do we all have a copy of, do we all have a copy? If you don't have a copy, please signify by raising your hand and you're gonna get a copy. And I'll advise that if you can get a pen as well, or a pencil, to just mark some things down as we go further in our teaching tonight, amen. Is that all right? Okay, so we quickly wanna remind ourselves of some truths that we've learned so far about comebacks, amen. And I'm just gonna start out, I believe it's in your handout that you have with you. Uh, the first truth that we need to remember is the fact that there are no comebacks without a setback. There are no comebacks without a setback. You cannot have a comeback in life except you have been through a setback. You might want to write that down, you know, in your handout. There will be no comeback or there are no comebacks without a setback, just like there is no victor without having gone through a battle. You know what I'm saying? You cannot just declare yourself victorious without having gone through a battle, right? So there's gotta be a battle, and you win the battle before you can be declared victorious. You know what I'm saying? There will be no testimony without a test. You must have been through a test in order for you to have a testimony. So if you're clamoring for a testimony, testimony, then you must be ready to go through a test. That's just the way life is set up. So we must remember that there are no comebacks without the setbacks. In as much as it's really beautiful and interesting, whenever it is that a team comes back from behind, but nonetheless, we must remember that there are no setbacks, there are no comebacks, rather, without a setback. We need to, you know, note that in a handout. The number two thing we need to remember is that every setback is a setup for a comeback. Uh, the first point is that there are no comebacks without a setback. But we must also remember that every setback that you go through in life is a setup for a comeback. Are you with me? And I must chip this in also. You might want to you know, write that down also. All right? Which is the fact that if you understand that there are no comebacks without a setback, then the next time that you see a setback, you start rejoicing over it because it's an opportunity for you to have a comeback. Are you get what I'm saying now? And let me quickly say this also. You must understand it's in God and with God. Whenever you have a setback, when you are coming back, you are coming back greater. Are you get what I'm saying? You are coming back greater. So whenever you have a setback, it's an opportunity for you to know that, woo, it's going to be a whole lot better. If you were expecting one thing, God's going to give you double. Ask Job. 
after he went through all that he went through, the Bible says God gave him what double for all the trouble. God never allows you to come back and you're still on the same level. No, it's going to be on a higher level. That I can guarantee you. In God, it will be a higher level. So the next time you see a setback, you do what? You start rejoicing because you know that you're doing what? Going to a higher level because you will never, I guarantee you in God, you will never, ever, 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 ever remain on the same level. Are you with me? So a setback, right, is a setup for a comeback. And the comeback is always greater on another level than the setback. So no one that, no one, you know, no one that, you know, the scripture talks about the fact that when you fall into diverse temptations, you rejoice. For happy are ye. You know what I'm saying? The Bible says, to whom is predestinated, them he also called. To whom he called, it justified. To whom he justified, it glorified. So the essence at the end thereof is unto glorification. You know what I'm saying? So your comeback will always be greater than your setback. Have a look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, your comeback will always be greater than your setback. That you need to know. You know, because when you know that, then you are rest assured that, okay, this is a setback, but I know it's going to be greater. I know because God will make it greater. The number three thing we need to remember is that a setback is intended not to punish you. You know, many times when people go through a setback, they feel like, man, God must be punishing me for something that I've done wrong. No, that's not the case. As a matter of fact, that was what the friends of Job were actually telling him, right? They said, you must have done something wrong. You must have done something wrong. But when you read the story of the book of Job, actually, he didn't do nothing wrong. You know what I'm I read that God was boasting about him. When God wanted to talk about Job to the devil, he said, have you seen the man, Job? There's none like him on the earth. I trust him so much. And Job was like, you touch his body, and you're going to say, well, this is going to curse you to death. And what happened? He never did that. Are you getting what I'm saying here? He never did that. So you know, sometimes when you experience a setback, it's not necessarily that you did something wrong. You know what I'm saying? It's not necessarily that you did something wrong. And let me shock you a little more. Even if you did something wrong, God in his, uh, uh, in, in his magnanimous nature already has a room for even your wrongs such that when you come back, it's still greater. Yeah. Are you getting what I'm saying? So regardless of what the enemy thinks it's trying to do, you know what the Bible says? The Bible says if they had known, they would not have crucified the king of glory. Are you getting what I'm saying? Because if Jesus had not died and resurrected, you and I would not be here. The Bible says if the Son of Man be lifted up, he would do what? Draw all men. He had to die and resurrect to draw you and I. So if whatever the enemy was trying to do, whether they were trying to kill him, silence him, are you getting what I'm saying here? And this is one thing you must understand. You realize, let me tell you this in Christendom, you might not know. For every blood of a believer being shed, all right, thousands more become believers. So for all the apostles that were Matthias, it, it gave back to you and I, are you getting what I'm saying here? So no matter what the enemy tries to do, your comeback will always be greater. Whether it's your fault or not, in God, God will make it great. Are you getting what I'm saying here? What the enemy meant for evil for, for, for what's his name, Joseph, God turned it around for, are you getting what I'm saying? So when you understand this, you begin to rejoice when a setback comes, even if it's your fault. I'm not saying you go around doing something wrong, but I'm just going to let you know that God is so big that even your wrongdoings, he has room for it to make it a better comeback. Are you with me? So whether you go left, right, center, front, and back, God has enough room to make your setback a comeback. All right, so we need to understand that whenever you experience a setback, it is not God punishing you, but rather it's to prepare you for the next stage of your responsibility. Are you with me? It's to prepare you for the what next stage of your response. That's the way all, all it is. Like I told you, your comeback will always be greater. Always be greater than your setback. And when you go on a greater level, it's a greater level of responsibility. Are you with me? It's a greater level of responsibility. Another thing we need to remember is that setbacks are the stepping stones to your future. That's the truth. Setbacks are the stepping stones to your future. Setbacks are not the barriers on the path to your future. I'm going to repeat that. You might want to write that down. Setbacks are not the barriers on the path to your future. They are the path to your future. Setbacks are not the barriers. Some of us think, oh, you have a plan set up, and all of a sudden something happens. You think, man, this is a barrier to you know, my future. No, it's not a barrier. Rather, it's actually the path to your future. Look at Joseph, if you will, with me. It felt like it was a barrier. The fact that he you know, was sold into slavery and all of that felt like it was a barrier. But it wasn't. Rather, it was the path to his future. You might not like the path, but trust me, when you get to the future, you're going to be excited about, you know, the path itself. When you're going through the path, what does the psalmist say? Yea, do I walk through the valley of the shadow of that I fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. You might not really like that path, but by the time you get into the future, you're going to be, ooh, Lord Jesus, I bless you for the path. Are you get what I'm saying? It's just like a mother with a baby. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, I like the pregnancy. But when the baby comes out, it's, you know, even the Bible talks about the fact that the mother is filled with joy. 
She has to push through the label, oh, Jesus, and she has to take, what's that stuff they take for pain? Uh, what's it? Uh, epidural, epidural, you know, and some, some mothers fight you know, against that. I don't want to take it, this, blah, 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 blah. But at the end of the day, when the baby comes out, you know, you're just, you're just rejoicing. Amen. You just forget about all the pain, right? And I, and I know of some mothers that they want to go back there again and again. I'm like, Jesus, isn't that interesting? I don't know how it feels, but I'm like, you know, the joy must be so exhilarating, you know, that you forget about all the pain. Am I correct? Amen. So your, your setback is a stepping stone to your future. It's not the barrier and the path to your future. Rather, they are the path to your future. And guess what? If you understand this truth, it will change your view about life. The next time you see a setback, you know, you, you look at it differently. You understand what I'm Because now you have a deeper understanding. Remember I mentioned last week that what the church is lacking right now is not so much, of, is not so much a prayer. And I thank God for this church that we'll pray in church and we'll continue to intensify and the power of prayer. Because the Bible says the effect of having prayer of the righteous make it power available. The Bible also talks about the fact, and this was God saying, my own people perish for what? For lack of knowledge. So sometimes it's not more prayer, it's more of understanding. A man of wisdom, the scripture says, will increase in understanding. You know what I'm saying? And like I said last week, I said prayer is in the success, prayer rather, is in the revelation equation. But if you want to be successful, understanding is in the success equation. You have to possess, and you must understand. If you don't understand, what does the Bible say? That the labor of a foolish man weary at what? Not just him, but everyone around him. Why? Not because he doesn't know you ought to go to the city, not because he doesn't know what you ought to do in the city, but because he doesn't know the way to the city. If you don't know the way, you're going to wither yourself out. That's the truth. And that's why you must possess an understanding. And that's why we're talking about this entire setback, you know, uh, and comeback, you know, series. So four things, remember, there are no comebacks without a setback. Every setback is a setup for a comeback. A setback is intended not to punish you, but to prepare you for your future and for the next stage of responsibility. And every setback, they're stepping stones, you know, to your future. So why do we have such a hard time with setbacks? Why have we spent so much time on it in this series? Now, the reason why we have such a hard time is because whenever we have a setback, all of us, nobody's exclu excluded, we panic. It's just a human nature, we panic. When things don't happen as fast as we want it, or don't happen as simple as we want it, we worry and we get anxious and we begin to doubt. Just as the human nature. And we even get to the point where we think God doesn't know what he's doing and we don't trust God and simply just become afraid. That's what happens. And that's why we spend a lot of time on this. Because whenever there's a setback, we just panic as humans. We just, when you have a plan and something just you know, interrupts your plan and nothing going the way you want to be, you just, you just panic. And you become afraid. And some of us begin to think that, okay, does God really know what he's doing? I had this all planned out. I had this all planned out. But, but, but does God really know what he's doing? You know, the Bible says there's a road that cements right to a man. You had it planned out. But God, who says the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning, knows what is best. Are you with me? So we become afraid. And I must let you know that fear is your greatest enemy in life. Fear is your greatest enemy in life. Fear, anxiety, and all those kind of things. And if you're going to experience a comeback from your setback the way God wants it to be, then you will have to learn how to deal with fear. Are you getting what I'm saying here? So the question is, what do you do when a setback fills you with fear? Now, it's critical to understand, we're going to look at some stories in the Bible where we see some examples of the kind of fears, there are several kind of fears that we all go through, and then we'll see the antidote to overcoming this fear. Are you with me? Now, but it's critical to note that everybody has a secret fear. Now, this has come on to all of us. Everybody, I don't care how tongue-speaking, fire-releasing, heavily booked and confirmed that you are, you know, <laughs> whatever you think you are, Holy Spirit filled, you know, you can move mountains. We all have secret fears. Are you with me? We all have, all of us, we all have secret fears. Even Job said, the thing that I fear the most, are you getting what I'm saying? So you see how important it is that we understand the antidote to this fear. You see what I'm saying? We understand. Some of us, you know, you may have the fear that nobody, you know, I'm going to make it a little real now, nobody's going to love you. Some people have a fear like that. You know, a lady in the house or a man, it doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman, you just feel like, you know, nobody's going to love me. You know, just have that secret fear. You know, some have the fear that life doesn't matter. You know, their life doesn't matter, rather. Some have the fear of never finding love. They feel like, well, I'm getting older each year, year in, year out, you know. It seems like I'm never going to find love. Some people have those, they might not say it outside, but they have those secret fears. Okay? 
Some people have the fear that people would reject them if they knew what they really are because of their past. Some people have those fears. And guess what fear does? Fear stops you from accomplishing the things that God wants you to accomplish because it's just going to halt you. You're just going to be, okay, I give up. And that's the reason why we must understand how to overcome this fear. We must understand how to overcome this fear. Let me quickly give you a quick definition of fear. All right, so that by the time we get into the antidote of fear, you understand. Somebody defined fear as this. The F stands for false. The E stands for fear, F-E-A-R. I'm not sure I spell it right. <laughs> the E stands for evidence. The A, false evidence appearing real. That's the definition somebody gets to fear. False evidence appearing real. What does that mean? Let me explain to you. I'll take you a little bit into physics. There's someone who call me Raj in physics. It's very simple. Y'all know it. You don't have to be a physicist. All right. You don't have to be deep science. You don't have to be yeah, some science. You don't have to have a PhD or something like that. All right. This is it. Whenever you're driving on a dry road, you're driving on a highway, sometimes you see way ahead of you, you see water on the road. All right. But by the time you drive close, it looks like the water vanished. You know what I'm That's a mirage. All right. That is just you know, an illusion. It's just, you know, I don't want to go deep into the explanation, but it's just some light rays you know, messing with your, with your visuals. You know what I'm saying? That's what fear is. It's false evidence appearing as if it's real. So it's just like you're driving on that road and you see water way ahead of you. By the time you move closer, the water is gone. It didn't evaporate. There was no water there in the first place. Are you with me? There was no water there in the first place. It's called mirage in physics. You know what I'm saying? It, there was no water there in the first place. That's what fear is. It's false evidence appearing real. But the truth of the matter is that it appears real. <laughs> you know what I'm Even though it's false evidence, it appears real. You know what I'm saying? It appears real. So we need to know how to deal with it. So let's look at the story together in the Bible, which is the Christmas story, all right, uh, to see how people were afraid about one thing or the other, how they dealt with the affair. So come with me, if you will, to the book of Luke in chapter 1 and verse 28 to 34. We're going to read Luke in chapter 1 from verse 28 to 24, uh, to 34, rather. And uh, in this particular book, we will see five common fears that people experience at, at that time and God's antidote to those fears. Now, I must say this to you before we read that, you know, I don't know what fears you have right now in your life. I know everybody's got one fear or the other. That's the truth. The whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God. Isn't that what it's in the court of law? <laughs> All right, so I don't know what fears you have right now in your life, but one thing that I know is that God does not want you to be afraid. Are you with me? And by the time we read the scripture, we will see in four different places where God had to tell them, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. God had to keep reassuring and tell them, I know you're scared. I know you're scared, but do not be afraid. And how do I know that God does not want you to be afraid? 2 Timothy 1.7 lets me know that God has not given us a spirit of what? Of fear, but a boldness of love and of a sound mind. Are you with me? So the last thing God wants us to be is to be afraid. And the first thing that the devil wants us to be is to be afraid. Are you know what I'm saying? So it's word and opposite. The last thing God wants us to be, and we all have someone we're scared of. I mean, you might not say it outside, but you got a secret fear in your life. But by the time we're done with this message, I believe that you will understand how to overcome these fears. Because fear can cripple you. It can stop you from accomplishing the things that you want to. Uh, Luke in chapter 1 and verse 28 Luke in chapter 1, from verse 28 to 34. Uh, we're going to read it together. Luke in chapter 1, from verse 28 to 34. Uh, where you at, Luke? Somebody said, if you're looking for the book of Luke, just look. You know, so Luke in chapter 1, from verse 28 uh, to 34. It's the Christmas story, the, you know, the birth of Jesus. We're very familiar with it, but let's just still read it, because we're going to be pointing some things out of it. All right, Luke in chapter 28. And the angel of the Lord, and the angel came in unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled. She was afraid. And the translation says, she was afraid at, at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. That's the first fear not. 
Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt receive, conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and he shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, saying, saying I know not? A man. How can this be, seeing that I know not a man? Now, the angel of the Lord, uh, you must understand that Mary was a very young girl, uh, probably at the age of 15, 16. I think she was actually 14. And that gets me thinking, man, they were married at that age back then. Oh, Lord, I'm mercy. Uh, anyways, you can argue about that later. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say, the Bible makes us to understand that she was betrothed to Joseph, right? It's a story we all know. They were planning to get married. You know, she's a virgin, according to scriptures. We're ready. They're, you know, excited and all of that. And all of a sudden, an angel appeared to her and brought the news of the fact that you will conceive. Like, think about it. Think about it, if you will. You were virgin, you were planning your marriage. You know how excited women are, and men are alike, but especially women, you know, when they're planning their marriage and stuff like that, and all of a sudden an angel appears to you and says you're pregnant? Like, that's gonna scare you to death. Like, are you kidding me? Pregnant from where? I've never known no man, nothing like that. What are you talking about? So Mary was scared when the angel brought the stuff, brought the news. And that's why the angel had to quickly address it. Do not be afraid. I know you're scared right now because she has every reason to be scared. Our, our plans just got interrupted. You know what I'm saying? She's all excited and all of a sudden, such a news will devastate you. I think so. That you're praying. How are you going to explain it? No, how are you going to explain it? Even in this present day, even though we're reading about, you know, you know, Mary and she was, you know, pregnant of the Holy Ghost. If anybody says that right now, we're going to be like, you're crazy. You, you Mary? Like, are you serious? Like, you, are you kidding me? You Mary? So she was scared. Uh, but what she was even more scared about was she was scared based on the fact that one, she's pregnant. Two, how can she be the one carrying the savior of the world? She was, it, she, it was a fear of inadequacy. It seems like, I don't think, I don't, I don't think, like, I don't understand all this. So the angel had to address it, do not be afraid. Let's read it from, 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 from my handout. It says, Mary faced the fear of inadequacy. The fear of inadequacy. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. So the angel said, do not be afraid, Mary, for God has decided to bless and use you. You will have a son and you are to name him Jesus and he will be the son of God and his kingdom will never end. Then Mary asked, but how can this thing be? It's right there in your note. So the first kind of fear was a fear of inadequacy. A fear of inadequacy. Because she was like, I don't think. And guess what? It wasn't only Mary that had a fear of inadequacy. I believe Moses also did. In the book of Exodus in chapter 4 and verse 10, when God told him, you're going to be delivered and all of that, Moses was arguing with God. It was like, you know, you know, I don't know how to talk. At a point in time, God was mad with him. Like, dude, shut up. <laughs> like, shut up. I'm telling you as God is what you're going to do. Are you telling me you cannot do it? Who created the mouth? Who created this? You get what I'm saying? Who created that? But we all have that fear. And it was not only Moses also. So yeah, I don't think it's just a woman, Mary, who, you know, who had fears. There were men too. Gideon too. Gideon was telling God, God, you know, you need to show me a sign. When God called him, God just called him and said, you're a mighty man of valor and you're going to be the next judge. It was like, what? You know, like somebody calls you. It's like somebody calls you a billionaire and you know you're not. You're going to be like, what? Who are you talking about? <laughs> That's what Gideon was doing back then. He said, like, God, you need to prove to me. Now, the point is this. What do you feel inadequate of? Listen, many times when God's going to take you to the next level, there will be a fear of inadequacy. Let me put it this way to you. God never calls the qualified. He calls people to qualify them. So what God wants you to do, you will never have adequate. That's the truth. You will never be fully prepared for it. Never, ever. So many times setups, setbacks showing up in our lives is actually God showing up. Are you getting what I'm saying here? It's actually God showing up in your life. And you will feel that fear of inadequacy. It's all right. 
But I can guarantee you many times it thinks that you know, the next level that you're going to, you will never have that feeling of adequacy for it. It will be that fair. So this was the first fair that you know, Mary, we're just going to go through about five different fairs and we'll get into the antidote. That is very important. The next fear is that, is that of Joseph. Let's, let's read a little further. It's in your handout. Joseph faced the fear of disapproval. Now, not, not only did Mary face the fear of inadequacy, now she goes ahead and tells Joseph. Now, how is Joseph going to explain that to his own boys? No, you tell me. You've been boasting about, oh, man, you got this girl, you know, or something. See, let me tell you something. It's a, it's a case of a song that the songwriter wrote. You know, Mary was meant to be his wife, soon to be his wife, you know what I'm saying? So let's assume Mary's name was Amaka. That means Amaka actually disappointed Joseph. Are you going to say here? There's a song that they say is Amaka disappointed. You know what I'm saying? That means Amaka, let's assume Jay, you, are you going to say, are you following what I'm saying here? So how does he explain this to his own boys? How does he? Like, he's been bossing all over the place, you know. I got this beautiful girl, this, that, that, that. And then Mary drops the bombshell, I'm pregnant. Of which he cannot, how does he? So Joseph experiences the fear of what? Of disapproval. I, I mean, like, how do I explain this? Let's read it together. Now, this is how Jesus was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit, something that has never happened before. Joseph, a fancy being a good and righteous man, decided to break off the engagement quietly so it would not disgrace Mary publicly. But after he had considered doing this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, do not be afraid. You see the second, do not be afraid? Joseph, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because the child in her is from God's Holy Spirit. If I were in Joseph's case, you know, I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> to be honest with you, I don't know. Because this has never happened. If we had a history of that, then you can be like, even with the history in this present day, I mean, it's people like, like, seriously, the first question you ask is, that, are you Mary? <laughs> are you about to give her to the second Jesus? You know what I'm saying? I mean, like, so, I mean, so the angel had to address that fear. Like, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. No, the angel said to Mary, do not be afraid, because he noticed the fear of inadequacy to that of Joseph. There was a fear of disapproval. He said, do not be afraid. Now, let's look at the third fear. I'm going through all this fear so that you can relate to one, one or the other, you know, because we all have secret fears. That's the truth. All right, now, the next one is, is actually with the shepherds. It's out there in your out, uh, out, online, out, and out as well. Uh, shepherds face the fear of unexpected change. The shepherds face the fear of unexpected change. Now, the story here is that the night, that night, some shepherds were in the fields outside the village guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them, and the radiance of God's glory flashed and surrounded them. They were terribly frightened. Simply, they were afraid. So the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Now, if there's one thing I know in life, nobody likes unexpected changes. For let's take a quick survey. If you like unexpected changes in your life, let me see your hands up in the air. You have your life all planned out. I want to do this, I want to do that. And there's something unexpected that throws your entire plan off, off track, happens. If you like it, let me see your hands up in the air. Like you really love it. Something unexpected just happens. Oh, ooh, you love it so much. Nobody does. These shepherds were cooling off in the middle of the night. They were having maybe some Thanksgiving dinner and something like that. And all, that. And all of a sudden, boom, something happens. Are you getting what I'm saying? How many times have you had plans for the year and something unexpected happens? Something you were not expecting, something you were not looking forward to. How many times? And it interrupts everything else that you have planned out. It's going to create fear. It's called the fear of the unexpected changes. That's the truth. It's going to create fear. That was exactly what the shepherds experienced. They were terribly frightened. But look at what the angel said again. Do not be afraid. So the moment the angel appears to them, he knows that it creates some sort of fear because it's an unexpected change. He addresses that fear immediately. Do not be afraid. Sounds like what God said to, was it Joshua? Only be strong and be courageous. He said, Joshua, my servant Moses is dead. It's time for you to take over. But do not be afraid. Only be strong and courageous. Because fear can cripple you. Whatever kind of fear it is, whether it's a fear of inadequacy, whether it's a fear of disapproval, whether it's a fear of unexpected change, whatever kind of fear it is, it can cripple you. Are you getting what I'm saying here? Again, like I said, the last thing God wants you to do is to be afraid. The first thing the devil wants you to do 
is to be afraid. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So the devil wants you to be afraid. God doesn't want you to be afraid. And that's why he said, I've not given you the spirit of fear, but a boldness of love and of a sound mind. Another kind of fear is the fear of losing control. The fear of losing control. How I many of you know that it's all right if you're the one driving, if you're the one on the way, it's all right to go at eight, I'm not saying it's okay, but you feel it's all right to go 80 miles, 90 miles per hour, right? Like, okay, I'm the one driving, I'm in charge, I'm in control. But if you were sitting at the passenger seat and somebody else is driving 80, man, you want to kill me, you got to step, you know what I'm saying? You start screaming, and be like, you got to slow down, brother. You got to slow down. I mean, come on, you're going too fast. But if you're the one driving, you don't think you're going too fast. That is the fear of losing control. And somehow we all have that fear. Losing control of one thing or the other in our life. We all love to be, I don't know about you, I, my, me, I love to be in control. Because then I can determine how fast I go, I slow it, you know what I'm saying? But whenever something's out of my control, then anxiety steps in. We, we, we worry. You know what I'm saying? Because nobody loves to lose control. And this was exactly what happened to King Herod. We can read it. It was, uh, by the time he heard that Jesus was born, he was like, man, the real king of the Jews. Because he was being considered the king of the Jews. Now he heard that the real king of the Jews was in town. It was like, man, this guy's going to take over from me. What did he do? He ordered for all the children from two years under to be killed. He was having the fear of losing control. In our families, what are you scared of losing control of? Or what is out of control in your life that scares you to death? Think about it. We all have those fears. We all do. Now, the fifth kind of fear is the fear of being disappointed. Now, this I know applies to all of us. The fear of being disappointed. The fear of being disappointed. If you've ever been disappointed before by any man or whatever, you will have the fear of being disappointed again. Because as humans, that's just the way we behave. That's just the way we, we react to things. And this happened in the life of Zechariah, when the angel appeared to him. While serving in the temple, it's right there in a handout. An angel appeared to Zechariah. When he saw the angel, he was confused and overwhelmed with fear. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid. Again, addressing the fear. Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Now, Zechariah has been praying for a child forever. So, maybe in time past, he has actually even heard that, you know, uh, this year you're going to have a child. But it didn't happen. So he had been disappointed over and over and over and over to the point whereby nothing seems to excite him anymore. Are you going to say? So when another angel came and said, do not, you know, you're going to have a child, he had the fear of disappointment. Now, this one is common to all of us. Are you in the house? If you're in the house and you've never been disappointed, let me see your hands up in the air. Like, never in your life. Never, ever. You've never been disappointed by nobody, nothing. And guess what happens? When you want to do that stuff all over again, what happens? You become afraid. Because you're thinking, wouldn't it repeat itself? Wouldn't the affliction repeat itself a second time? So we all have this fear of disappointment. If you've ever been in a relationship and it didn't work out, when you're going to the next one, you're scared to death. You're like, am I sure it's not going to be like the last one? It's the fear of disappointment. If you try to do something, you did an exam and it didn't work out. All right? When you're trying to do it again, you're like, am I sure I'm not going to fail? If you try to go for a career, you go for a job interview and you were not selected. And the next time you want to try it out, you're going to be like, are you going to say here? The fear will be there. It's called the fear of disappointment or the fear of being disappointed. And we all have those fears. Now, the question is, out of all these five fears, which one have you faced? I for sure can tell that I faced the fear of disappointment. I don't know about you. I have. And, it, and guess what? The thing about this fear is that it's reoccurring. And that's why we're taking time to talk about it. It's reoccurring. You see what I'm saying? Because that's the human nature. If you've ever been disappointed before, if you want to try the same thing again, the fear comes in. And remember, what the devil wants is for you to what? To be afraid. And the last thing that God wants you to be is to be afraid. Yes. Are you with me? So the, both the devil and God is competing. The devil wants you to be afraid. God doesn't want you to be afraid. Because when you are afraid, then it stops you from what? Trying again. It stops you from having a comeback. That's the truth. So now having gone through the different kind of fears, how can we replace these fears with faith?
in our lives. How can we do that? Now, the first thing that we need to do, and this is critically important, very important, all right, is that we surrender, you surrender my life completely to God every day. It's in your handout. You surrender your life completely to God every day. That's the first antidote to fear. And I'm going to take a little time to explain this. Surrender your life to God completely every day. Not sometimes, not a few times, every day. Let's read what we have in our handout, and then I'm going to explain further. In the case of Mary, Mary responded, I am the Lord's servant, and I'm willing to accept whatever God wants for my life. That's a surrender. Whatever God wants for my life. It's in Luke 1 and verse 38. Luke 1, 38. Now, surrender your heart to God. Turn to him in prayer and give up your sins. Then you won't be ashamed. You will be confident and fearless. Your troubles will go away like water beneath the bridge, and your darkest night will be brighter than the noon. Then you will rest safe and secure, filled with hope and emptied of worry. This was Job, talking in the book of Job in chapter 11 from verse 13 to 18. Note those words. It says, surrender your heart to God. Turn to him in prayer and give up your sins. Is there anything like that? then you will not be ashamed. Now, so the resultant effect of surrendering to God is that you will not be ashamed. You need to underline that in your, in your handout. So when you surrender to God, the scripture says you will not be ashamed. This is in Job in chapter 11 from verse 13 to 18. Now, the next thing that will happen is that you will become confident and fearless. You will become what? Confident and fearless. So the antidote to all those fears that we've talked about, whichever time that you've been through or you're going through right now, is that you surrender to God. And when you do what happens is that you will not be ashamed. You become confident and fearless. You need to wander like that. And you will rest safe and secure, filled with hope and emptied of worry. Isn't that amazing? Filled with hope and empty of worry. That word surrender, your heart to God, means to trust in God completely, every day. So what does that mean? That means on a daily basis, before you start going about your, your daily duties, what do you do? You go on your knees, or however way you pray, you stand, you walk around, however way, or you lay in your bed, because the Bible says the righteous cry aloud on their beds. So however way you pray, all right, you cry to God and say, Lord, I surrender today to you. I trust in you completely. Are you getting what I'm saying here? What does the Bible say? Trust in the Lord God with all your heart, leaning on your own understanding, all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your part. What does the scripture say? It says it will do what? You will not be ashamed. You will be confident and fearless. What are we trying to be? To be what? Fearless. So the antidote to fear is you surrendering, and that surrender means trust in God. Now, when I was preparing for this message, a question popped up in my mind, and it is, what if I have trusted God, and somebody may have gone through this before, what if I have trusted God for something and it didn't work? Won't I have the fear of being disappointed? I don't know if you have trusted God for something and it feel like it didn't work. Let me see your hands up. You trusted, you fasted, you prayed. All the things they told you to do, you did it, but it looks like it didn't work the way you wanted it to. So we have witnesses in the house. Now when that happens, it creates fear in you. The fear of what? Disappointment. Now the question is, how do you deal with that? The way you deal with that is by surrendering. We've read all of that. But there's another thing you need to do, because this is the way the human nature, and you need to understand the psychology of this. You will be blessed when you get this, because a whole lot of Christians are walking around with so much unresolved issues in their heart. They love God, they believe God, but they have some unresolved issues. They have some issues that they felt like they trusted and prayed to God for, but that ain't coming to pass, quote unquote, or it seems like that ain't coming to pass. Now, this is what you do. Listen, whenever a crisis occurs in your life, something you trusted God for and prayed for and all of that, and it seems like it didn't come to pass in your life, never let that crisis go to waste. How do I mean? Make sure you get a closure on it. How do I mean by that? Make sure you ask God why you did not get it. Are you what I'm saying here? It's okay to ask God questions. I don't know why people came up with that song, uh, Unquestionable, Unquestionable God. You know, you can't, no, I don't know why they came up with that. You can question him. Let me tell you, the man who is known as, you know, the, the, the All Mac, not the All Mac, the man who is known as the man of faith, Smith Wigglesworth, if you've ever read the book God's General, is, is a book written 
80 something. You know, God's genera, it's an old book, you know, amazing. Smith Wigglesworth was a man of faith. Jim trying to say, his wife died, okay? But the man would not let go. He prayed to God, asking why did she have to die? And guess what? God brought the woman back to life. The woman explained to him, you know, why she had to die. Now when he understood it, he let go. You understand? Know so don't let that, or else you will have that secret doubt in your heart. You have to close it out. And the way you do it is by asking God, why didn't it happen? Because you're going to keep this fear of disappointment. Are you going to say it? It will keep following you. Are you following what I'm saying here? So there must be a closure. Ask God, why didn't it come to pass? I fasted, I prayed, I did this, I did that. Why? I, he will exp I guarantee you God will explain to you. Even Paul wouldn't let go. He said, I besought the Lord three times. Until God told him, my grace is sufficient for thee, that's when he relaxed. He didn't ask him the fourth time anymore. But because he didn't get nothing the first time, he didn't get nothing the second time, until God spoke to him the third time. So do you have unresolved doubt in your heart? Clear it out. Are you with me? Clear it out. Talk to God about it. Okay? Ask him why. God, why didn't this work out? I did this, I did this, I did it. Please explain. He will explain to you. If you don't have the closure, you can shout hallelujah, glory be to God, praise the Lord, all of that. But somewhere in your heart, we call it subconscious, you still, whenever you want to do that same thing again, you'll be like, oh, the last, am I sure? And that's what the devil's going to magnify. That's what the devil's going to use that fear. But when you have a closure, when Smith Wigglesworth was told by his wife, the wife came back to life like 30 minutes, explained to him, and even the Bible was trying to give us a closure when the Bible says the righteous die, and you don't understand that it's the Lord that taketh them for the day of evil ahead. Are you going to say, so make sure you get a closure. Make sure you do what? Get a closure. And the way you get a closure is by asking God. All right? You ask God, God, why didn't it happen at this particular, and he will explain to you. I guarantee you, he will. When Job asked questions, did he answer? Of course he did, even though Job had to be ready for his own questions too. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? But it's critical to have that closure. Okay? And then you surrender your life, and this is what happens. Your heart to God, and then you won't be ashamed. The second thing is that the second antidote to fear is that you stop listening to the voices of fear. Okay? Listen, the Bible says faith cometh by hearing and hearing alone by the word of God, right? Guess what? Fear also comes by hearing and hearing alone what is not the word of God. Yes. Are you going to say? So the same way faith comes is the same way fear comes. So you've got to replace your fear with your faith. If you keep listening to what is not the word of God, you're going to keep living in fear. Whether it's the fear of disappointment, disapproval, whatever kind of fear it is. But you replace that fear with faith by listening to that which is the word of God. And by stop listening. If you have to turn, on the, turn off the TV, don't listen to CNN and Fox News. Because they're going crazy these days. I watch Fox News and I'm like, what are you talking about? Two different sides of a spectrum. <laughs> I'm like, this is alternative reality. I'm like, okay, I'm just going to see through by the word of God because I don't understand these folks no more. I hear them saying it. So you stop listening to the voices of fear. So if you have to turn off your, you know, your TV and turn off whatever it is that creates fear, I hear them saying it. If you have to stop Googling stuff, Google is not a doctor. You feel a pain in your leg, you go Google it. Google is going to tell you it's related to cancer. To, I'm telling you. Google is, and when you listen to all of that, it's going to fill your heart with fear. Yes. Isn't it true? Yes. You just have a slight headache and you just Google, you know, symptoms of a slight. Google is going to give you, oh, Jesus, Lord, it's going to fill you with a lot of fear. That's the truth. I mean, is there a weakness in the house? I don't know about you. You Google some, oh, Lord, how much? I'm not saying you shouldn't use Google for your research and stuff like that. But when it, man, it's going to fill you with a lot of fear. So you need to stop listening to the voices of fear and start listening to the voice of faith. And if that requires changing your inner circle as well, yes. If you're evolving around people, the Bible says a companion of fools will be destroyed. If you're walking with people who, who are fear mongers, you know what I'm saying? Uh, some, of us, some of us know who is, is the, uh, don't let me say anything. Is the fear, are you know what I'm saying? Uh, you know, <laughs> if you're walking around fear mongers, you know what I'm saying? You will be a fearful person. But if you're walking around people of faith, you will be a, a faithful per Are you getting what I'm saying here? So the number two antidote is for you to stop listening to the voice of fear and stop listening to the voices of faith. If you have to turn off your TV, turn off your radio, and just fill your heart with the word of faith. All right? The next thing is, which is connected to one and two, is to fill your mind with the music that praises God. 
So instead of you listening to you know, whatever kind of music that doesn't help your situation, you fill your mind with music that praises God. Are you following what I'm saying here? So if you have to have a playlist of songs that remind you of the greatness of God. Remember I mentioned last week that the way to energize, to be strengthened on the inner man when you, when you feel discouraged is by you remembering the things that God has done in time past. Then you become strengthened on the inner man. That's what the psalmist said. He said, you know, why thou cast down all my soul and why thou disquieted within me? He said, I will yet praise him who is the health of my countenance. For deep call it unto deep at the noise of thy water spray. He started remembering the things God has done in time past. So if you have to start listening to songs that remind you of God's greatness, you got to do that. You cannot keep listening to songs that farms, uh, uh, puts more fire to your feet. Are you getting what I'm saying here? These things are practical things. You know, so the next time you're afraid of something, remember the first thing you do is that, Lord, I surrender, I trust in you. The, next, the second thing that you do is that you do what you stop listening. The moment you know where the fear is coming from, you know that faith coming by hearing, fear also comes by hearing, you start walking towards where faith is. And then you start listening to me. This is a practical thing. Are you going to say here? Because let me tell you, fear is reoccurring. So you have to understand how to actually attack it in a reoccurring manner too. You know what I'm saying? As you leave here today, something will probably scare you. I can almost guarantee you of that. But when you remember these things, you what? You put the antidote. Are you following what I'm saying here? Now, the, th the fourth thing, and this was exactly what all those people that were described in the Bible did. All right, if you look at the scripture in Luke 1, 46 to 56, Mary sang. They were singing praises to God. Elizabeth sang. Uh, the, the shepherd sang. Zachariah also sang. If you read those scriptures, they all did what? They all sang praises to God to overcome the fear. The fourth thing that you do is that you base your hope on the promises of God. You base your hope on the promises of God. Let's see what Elizabeth said. Elizabeth said to Mary, it's, it's in your handout. It's the fourth point. Base your hope on the promises of God. Elizabeth said to Mary, you are blessed because you believe that the Lord will do what he said. Listen to this. The Bible says that God is not a God to lie. Neither is he a son of man to repent. Let me explain what that means to you so you understand. Y'all see this stuff over here. The color is black, right? It is black, right? I think I'm not colorblind. He's black. <laughs> All right. Now, if God says to you, when the Bible says God is not a God to lie, this is not a man to obey, this is what it means. This stuff is black. All right. But if God says to you that this stuff is white, before you look at it a second time to confirm that it's actually black, it changes white. So God cannot lie. You know what I'm saying? If he has to turn things upside down for you to see the way he wants you to do it, he's going to do it. Are you getting what I'm saying here? So that's why the Bible says he's not a God to lie, neither a son of man to repent. You are too small to make him a liar. Let all men be liars and only God be the true. Are you following what I'm saying here? So before you think, oh, God is lying, you just be like, ooh, what happened? I, you're going to change your glasses black. Am I colorblind? Are you following what I'm saying here? So the antidote here is base your hope on the promise of God. And this is the reason for that. All right? The promises of God, they are yea and amen. They are backed up with an eternal power. They are backed up with a power that is undefeated. Are you going to say? They are backed up with a power that nobody can overturn. Are you following what I'm saying here? So when you base your hope on this eternal power, the promises that comes from the creator of the heavens and the earth, the possessor of the heavens and the earth, who is a God, a God who, is, who would not lie, neither a son of man to repent, it will come to pass. And Mr. Uh, Mr. E.J. was preaching on, 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 on Sunday, talking about standing firm on the promises, the word of the Lord. Are you following what I'm saying here? The word of the Lord. And the reason for that is this. See, the word of the Lord is filled with possibilities. We had, we had a program some time ago, it's called Possibilities Everywhere. The word of the Lord is filled with eternal possibilities. Are you from eternal possibilities? So when you anchor your hope on that, there is no limit. There are no boundaries. Are you getting what I'm saying? So the four antidotes all right, for fear is that one, you surrender your life to God. Two, you stop listening to the voices of fear. Three, you fill your mind with the music that praises God. And the fourth thing, is that you base your hope on the promises of God. Can we go over it one more time? You can, you can write it down. The first thing is that you surrender your life to God. The second thing is that you stop listening to the voices of fear and start listening to the voices of faith. The third thing is that you fill your mind with music that praises God. And the fourth thing is that you base your hope on the promises of God that is embedded in internal power. 
That's the truth. And remember, if you have unresolved issues, make sure you get a closure. Talk to God about it. And as you do this, all your fear will vanish in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we rise on our feet this evening?